Welcome, everyone. Uh, everybody, I'm Jason Malloy. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Louisiana Lafayette. Uh, I'm also the holder of the Cali Saloum Endowed Chair in Political Science at UL. And in that capacity, I get to be your host for this latest installment of the Saloon Chair Speaker Series. Now, some of you can remember way back in the mists of time, about two and a half years ago, uh, <laughs> the Saloon Chair Series was inaugurated in January of 2016 with the mission of provoking conversations on the UL campus about democratic institutions and democratic constitutions. Uh, and the institutional foundations of democratic political systems, uh, not only close to home, but also around the world. So we've brought uh, over a dozen speakers uh, from around the country, uh, from the uh, uh, areas of academic research relating to law and politics and policy, uh, to help us understand trends and developments in uh, uh, the field of research that studies democratic institutions. And uh, this evening, I'm very happy uh, to have Dr. Joe Lane with us to continue the Saloon Chair Speaker Series, to continue that kind of conversation. And as you can see uh, from the <coughs> lovely screen above my head, he's going to be talking to us about constitutional conventions. Now, I want to stress that this is one of the most interesting uh, kinds of topics in the broader field of studying democratic institutions. And I think we've been reminded of that in recent days with uh, things in the news, a uh, little old thing called the Supreme Court nomination. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, of course, we have a Supreme Court where um, unaccountable judges, once it, they get on the court, they're there for life. And they decide the meaning of the fundamental law of the political system known as the US Constitution. And people often ask themselves, hang on, this is a democratic political system. At what point do ordinary citizens or their elected representatives have some say about what the fundamental law of the political system means? And this topic is one of the answers. It's one of the main answers. According to some analysts, it's the only legal mechanism for ordinary citizens and their elected representatives uh, to determine authoritatively what the fundamental law means of a democratic political system. So constitutional conventions have this important role uh, in democracies, and yet many people are afraid of constitutional conventions, and that's uh, going to be what our speaker uh, <laughs> this evening is talking about. Um, and I also just wanted to mention uh, those of us who follow Louisiana politics closely. Maybe I shouldn't use the first person. Those of you who follow <laughs> Louisiana politics very closely, uh, you know that in recent years, the state legislature has been looking very carefully and seriously at the possibility of calling a constitutional convention to revisit the Louisiana state constitution. Um, so potentially, in the not too distant future, it's conceivable uh, here in Louisiana, we could be dealing with a constitutional convention. Um, and, and many people are afraid of a state constitutional convention for the same reasons that they might be afraid of a federal constitutional convention. Um, so we're going to explore some of those issues tonight. Now, our, our guest speaker who's going to uh, help us through this conversation uh, comes to us from back east. <laughs> uh, as a native Texan, I, I feel entitled to use the phrase back east uh, very broadly. Uh, Dr. Joe Lane uh, is uh, a native of Tennessee, uh, but he got his uh, first degree, his bachelor's degree, at Hampton Sydney College in Virginia, a double major in classics and political science, uh, so that's quite impressive. He went on from there to complete his PhD in political science at Boston College, that's in Massachusetts, also back east, um, and he taught uh, at Emory and Henry College, uh, also in Virginia. Um, for over 15 years, he rose to the position of chair of the Department of Politics, Law, and International Relations at Emory and Henry. In addition, uh, a very important uh, a career achievement was um, serving as the founding director of the Honors College 
um, at Emory and Henry. Currently, he is the uh, a Cochrane Professor of Political Science at Bethany College in West Virginia. In addition to that, he is the Provost and Dean of the Faculty at Bethany College. Uh, that explains the very nice suit that he's, he's wearing today. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Um, one of the things I, I really like about Dr. Lane, uh, really warms my heart. Part of the reason I, I so badly wanted him to come speak on this campus um, is his wide ranging and, and really uh, diverse uh, research interests and um, uh, research accomplishments. Uh, so you can see this from uh, published journal articles, um, including the American Political Science Review, pretty much the most prestigious uh, journal, academic journal in our field. Um, he's published on a variety of topics, including ancient political thought, including American political thought, including environmental political thought. You probably didn't see that one coming. Um, mm -hmm. As well as constitutional law. So a, a really terrific, uh, diverse array of interests. And I think maybe the best way to see just how broad and, and, and fascinating uh, Joe Lane's research agenda has been is, is to just look at the three books that he's co-edited um, over the years. So first in 2005, uh, he was co-editor of a book titled The Deconstitutionalization of America. Sounds like quite a manifesto to me. You uh, made that word up. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly is a long one. Uh, <laughs> almost a, a German length of a word. Yeah. Um, the next one was called Engaging Nature, Environmentalism and the Political Theory Canon. Uh, that's relatively recent, 2014. Uh, but most recently is a volume about a uh, contemporary novelist that some of you may be familiar with that's titled A Political Companion to Marilyn Robinson. And that came out in 2016. Uh, so again, a, a really uh, wonderful scholar. I'm so pleased to have him here. Uh, so please help me welcome Dr. Joe Lane. Thank you all. I, w I want to thank um, Jason Malloy and uh, the University of Louisiana Lafayette. I get that close to right? Lafayette? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, and, and also I have to, have to thank um, uh, Professor Christy Malloy, who's back there playing the role of uh, a remote control to make this PowerPoint go. And you're going to be really disappointed because you're like, man, if he needs somebody to show this PowerPoint, this is going to be a really great PowerPoint. I stink. I stink at PowerPoint. Um, uh, Dr. Malloy uh, will tell you, she, she was my student um, uh, many years ago when I was young and she was younger. And, um, and, uh, and she said, gosh, I, I, I came to your class for years. I never knew you used PowerPoint. You know, it's, it's, a recent, it's a recent thing I've picked up. I've got a 12-year-old. She's teaching me stuff all the time. Um, but it really is an honor to be here and to be asked to weigh in on a topic that I've given a great deal of thought for a long time, but I haven't really actually written about it. Um, and when Jason asked me uh, to prepare this talk, he said, would you come talk? Sure, I'd come talk. You know, why well, don't come talk about constitutional conventions and whether or not we should have one? Sure, I'll come talk about it. He was like, can you argue in favor of, of, of having one? And then I'm like, well, wait just a second. I, I, I'm not so sure that's the way I'm going. I, I, I would go, and he was like, he was like, oh come on, it'll be fun. <laughs> so I so I, I dug in. This was something I'd thought about for for a long time. Um, I've talked about it in class, certainly back to, to when Christy was in my class, um, you know, 15, 16 years ago. I I would talk about this regularly, but but hadn't really committed much of it to writing, and so I really appreciated the opportunity to do this. Um, I, I I couldn't settle on a title. Um, who's afraid of a convention of the states was one, you know. Should, should we be afraid of the idea that we might have a constitutional convention? And then, Christy, you flip to the second. We'll get, or a little rationalization now and again may be a good thing, which is a play on uh, Thomas Jefferson. What did Jefferson say a little now and again to be a good thing? Revolution. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. Um, I'm going to say a little short of the revolutionary level, but go to the constitutional rationalization level. We'll see if this works. But, but generally, people like myself, people who study the Constitutional Convention, tend to be skeptics of constitutional conventions, even the idea of constitutional conventions. And this is an odd thing. After all, we spend all of our, our professional life, we get deeply invested in studying and teaching a rather finite historical event, 
and investing immense importance in that event. We celebrate, dissect, review, reflect upon the uniquely productive way that we, the people, created a constitution in 1787, 1788. And in some cases, we wish to guide ourselves. We tell our students, these are great human beings. You want to live up to being like these people. We celebrate their purported wisdom. We found philosophies called originalism. Original what? Well, what they said in 1787, 1788. You know, you would think we'd be really into constitutional conventions. We, we'd want to talk about doing this all the time, and we don't. Instead, most of us kind of, you know, shrivel up inside and go, no, you can't do that again. That's not, that's not something you do again. You know? Now, I understand that my colleague, um, he and I actually taught together in Hampton, Sydney many, many years ago. Um, John Dynan already came in this series at some point and spoke, and, and he's kind of the expert on uh, state constitutional conventions, 233 of them. Uh, that's his number. I have no reason to doubt him that have contributed to what he calls the accumulated wisdom and experience of American constitution makers. And Dynan is at times critical of particular decisions and processes, but he, he's actually somewhat of an optimist. He generally celebrates the American experience of popular conventions that directly engage in constitution making. But we need to be honest about the fact that among most of us who study constitutional theory, Dynan's an outlier. We as a group tend to reduce constitution making in the United States to a singularity. It happened 231 years ago. It lasted from May 25th, 1787 to September 17th, 1787, 136 days, right? And because we're on a college campus, we all have to remember September 17th as a date because Robert Byrd of my now current state of West Virginia said that if you don't do something to celebrate the Constitution on September 17th, then you lose all your federal funds. Um, you know, that, that makes it special, right? Um, it only had 55 participants. Most of them only played bit roles. Only about 15 to 20 of the people who were there were regulars worthy of the mythology we invest in them. The founders, or if you're after Warren G. Harding, the founding fathers. Um, it, it acted almost entirely outside of its legal authority. It only managed to pass about 27 resolutions. It distilled them into 4,500 words, packed them into a document that they printed on just four broadsheets. That's all they needed. And then in a little bit less than a year, the American people met in these, these little conventions in 11 of the 13 states, you know, within a year had approved it. And by 1789, we had a new government. Good enough, we've done our constitution making, stop. We kind of treat it that way a lot of the time. This narrative, the constitutional convention has enjoyed just this remarkable historical reputation. They haven't even finished meeting when no less than Thomas Jefferson he was, he was off. He was kicking ass as the ambassador to France. Oh, come on. I can't get a better laugh than that <laughs> for a Hamilton joke. I've been meeting all the many ladies. I basically missed the late 80s. Apparently, a recent Supreme Court nominee missed the late 80s for a whole entirely different reason. <laughs> but um, Jefferson called it a gathering of gods and demigods, and they were still alive. They created this divine compact that gets thrown around a lot. It was a work divided, guided by providence, a machine that would go of itself, a government that approaches nearer to perfection than any government hitherto instituted among men. That was George Washington, but he was there, so you know, we should probably distrust his version of this a little bit. These titles, and indeed much of our veneration of the Constitution, suggest that the document that emerged was perfect from the outset. But clearly that was not the position of many of those within the convention or the country at the time of its adoption. Nor did they expect their handiwork would be able to provide sound governance without subsequent amendment and adjustment. Indeed, we should always remember that the 1787 Constitutional Convention was at least the third major effort to convene a body to frame a federal constitution in less than a decade then leading up to 1787, they'd already done this three times. And we throw in the fact that there were over two dozen constitutional assemblies in the states that took place in the 1780s, we should recognize that the men who gathered in Philadelphia were deeply familiar with the politics of remaking constitutions and convention. In fact, they probably thought that was a normal thing that was going to happen all the time because in their lifetime, it was what was happening all the time. Surely they expected the American experience with constitution making and constitution revising and conventions would continue beyond the 1787 Philadelphia effort. 
Many of them said as much on the floor of the convention itself. However, the idea that the Constitution would provide within itself for future conventions was a late addition to the document. Article 5, as we have it, you can flip, first thing we'll get Article 5, there you go, um, emerged from a suggestion of George Mason, delegate of Virginia, who raised the issue of an amendment process that would not require congressional action on September 15th. Now, what was the day the convention adjourned? I just told you. September 17th, right? So we've been meeting all summer long, and we get 48 hours from the end. We're going to sign this baby and be out of here. Oh, yeah. I think maybe we need to have a, a convention method for revising this Constitution. He stated he did not think that it was wise that only Congress could initiate changes in the Constitution that purported to limit the authority of Congress. And after a relatively hurried floor discussion with only one approved vote, declaring that two-thirds of the state legislature should be allowed to call a convention of the states to approve amendments to the Constitution. They sent off the committee in detail overnight, drafted what became Article 5, what we have here on the board, which is what we have now, and that was it, right at the very end. So we have the normal way, or what we've come to think of the normal way of proposing amendments to the Constitution. Two-thirds of both houses of Congress shall propose amendments to this Constitution. Of the 27 amendments to the Constitution that have been ratified since the Constitution took effect, how many of them came from the two-thirds vote of both houses of Congress? All of them. That's where they all came from. Or, on the application of the legislatures of two-thirds of the states, shall call a convention for proposing amendments, which in either case shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of this Constitution. When ratified, sorry for the double comma, told you I wasn't good at PowerPoint, the legislatures in three quarters of the several states or conventions in three fourths thereof, as the one or the other mode of ratification may be proposed by the Congress, and then some reasons why things you can't do through ratification. Now, it may be worth noting that the final clause restating limitations on congressional action vis-a-vis -vis the slave trade and tax provisions covered in Article 1, Section 9 were needed only because the convention method opened the possibility that constitutional amendments might be made that would exceed explicit limits on Congress's power without coming through Congress, right? That's why they had to do it that way. But as it turns out, Mason's alert here was kind of turned out not to result in much, okay? Number one, Mason got convention amendment into the Constitution as he wanted, but it didn't satisfy him. He also wanted a Bill of Rights at the last minute, and they just wouldn't do that at the last minute. So it turned out that Mason was one of the three people who were present on the last day of the convention who wouldn't sign the Constitution anyway. And in fact, he fought the Constitution. He went back, he got elected to the Virginia State Ratifying Convention. He was a, he was a a loud and vociferous no vote and wrote under some various pseudonyms reasons why he didn't think the Constitution should be approved. The other reason why it turns out that it wasn't very much is here we've lived under this thing for all of this time and we've never, ever done it. We have never called or convened a convention of the states to amend the Constitution yet. Okay? Now this is not to say that the Convention of the States language of Article 5 has been utterly inert in our constitutional history. There is some evidence that, that concerns that a convention might be called may have hastened congressional conversions to support what became the 17th Amendment and, and, and thus produced the direct election of senators, but the fact remains we've never had an Article 5 convention. However, the last few years have seen real energy on both the right and the left in favor of calling such a convention. Christy, can you? So I, I just give you some, some examples. These aren't nearly the only ones. The American Legislative Exchange Council, which is very conservative. Convention of the States Project is very conservative. Wolfpack, quite liberal. Um, Citizens for Self-Governance, conservative, maybe not as much as some of the others. Root Strikers, really, really liberal. Compact for American Educational Foundation is also conservative. Marge Lessig's from Harvard. Where does that put him on the liberal scale? As well as other you know, eminent political scientist Larry Sabato, who a lot of people consider to be something of a centrist, and, and, and Sanford Levinson from Stanford, they're hardly alone. So all of these groups of late have been not just calling in the press, writing articles, but I mean actually working state legislatures to try to get them to call constitutional, for a constitutional convention to deal with at least certain types of amendments. So what do they think they could resolve through amendments? Christy, the next slide, please. Thank you. 
The most popular one by a lot is requiring a balanced federal budget. And in different forms, it's not clear if you have to pass these in exactly the same form, but there are two basic versions of this that are circulating. 27 states have, have petitioned Congress for a convention to consider amendments that would require us to balance the federal budget, okay? That's out of 34 that are needed to get the two-thirds number that you would have to have to get a convention. There are also significant numbers of petitions that have been presented to Congress to fix the Electoral College, to address the distribution of votes in the U.S. Senate, but keep in mind, Amendment 5, Article 5 says that every state would have to vote to, devote, to give up its equal representation in the Senate for such an amendment to take effect, to address gerrymandering of House districts, to overturn Citizens United. Lawrence Lessig, again of Harvard, ran for, for the Democratic nomination for president precisely to try to get this done, um, to overturn Citizens United last uh, election, um, or to limit or change Congress's power to tax. And curiously, there are versions of those amendment calls that are circulating on both the left and the right um, who want to change that. Now, who opposes this move towards a convention of the states? I'm going to put up quotes in the next slide, Christy, um, from David Super of Georgetown Law. He tends to be a ringleader in this regard. Walter Olson at the Cato Institute also tends to be a ringleader in this regard. But basically what their stand-ins for are scholars of constitutional law who tend to be very, very dismissive of the idea this would work. Now, I picked two of David's quotes just because this is the part of the issue, because there's so much to this you could do that I really want to focus in on and I want us to, to pay attention to for a little bit um, before I wrap up. So the two quotes, if you're having trouble reading from the back of the room, first, much of the opposition to calling an Article 5 convention results from the danger that such a convention could veer in dangerous and unpredictable directions, especially in this toxic political atmosphere. Or calling an Amendment 5 convention is reckless, especially at this divisive moment in our nation's political history. Nothing these groups propose does anything even to mitigate the risk that a convention would bring. State legislatures should not delude themselves that the dangers of an Article 5 convention can somehow be contained. Be afraid. This is terrible stuff. You don't want to go here. You're going to be absolutely in terrible position. So the common thread that I want to emphasize here is that super Walter Olson, many other opponents of calling Article 5 convention rely very heavily on a two-part argument. Number one, if there is a convention, it could run away, like the 1787 convention arguably did, and re-examine the major assumptions of American constitutionalism that once swept aside would be impossible to renew. They could go saying, we're going to pass an amendment to balance the budget. They could come out and saying, we're going to have a unicameral legislature and a prime minister and I don't know what crazy European stuff they might come up with, and then we would all be thoroughly hosed, okay? And it's particularly dangerous to do now. Why? Because we are at a particularly partisan and factious moment in our history. Now, in what follows, I plan to assume that the latter point is true. We are at a particularly partisan and factious moment in our history. But I don't think that's a reason to fear a convention of the states to potentially amend the Constitution necessarily. Indeed, in my opinion, that might be a reason to consider a convention of the states seriously. And this is an opinion that I came to somewhat to my own surprise when I was working on this project over the last month or so. This is not out of any persuasion that such a convention would be a cure for or immune from the factious behavior we see before us, but because I'm cautiously optimistic and I'd emphasize the caution as well as the optimism that a convention to propose amendments to the Constitution might allow us to sublimate the partisanship we see into something more valuable than it is to us today. An opportunity to reconsider institutions that are not functioning well and to place them on a sounder basis that might better work in our modern era. So let us all remember that the Constitution we almost all revere, the 1787 convention, was a runaway convention. They were told that they were supposed to go to Philadelphia to revise and extend the Articles of Confederation to render them adequate to the exigencies of union. It took them precisely two weeks, and really only one day of serious debate, to decide that they weren't going to revise and extend the Articles of Confederation at all. They were going to throw it out and get a whole new constitution. And they, they had done that by the end of May, for all intents and purposes, right? So they did run away. 
We also should make no mistake, however, that this convention took place at a particularly partisan and factious time. You might even call it a toxic political atmosphere. <laughs> Consider the following snippet from Gunning Bedford speaking in the Constitutional Convention. Next slide. All right. I have to read this slide. I know it's bad form to read slides, but, but Gunning Bedford, oh, it's just great stuff. You ready? You got to get in the spirit, okay? This is a, a much hotter room, right? We're, we're in an upper room in Philadelphia in, in coming up into July, end of June. Sod has been nailed to the walls so reporters can't hear what's happening inside. Um, and the windows are painted black and won't open. You are miserable. And Gunny Bedford lets well with this one. I say it is indeed the last moment if we do agree to this assumption of power. What he meant was proportional representation in both houses of Congress. The states will never again be entrapped into measures like this. The people will say the small states would have confederated and grant further powers to Congress, but you, the large states, would not. Then the fault would be yours and all the nations of the earth will justify us. What is to become of our public debts if you dissolve the union? Where's your plighted faith? Will you crush the smaller states or must they be left unmolested? And then the really good part. Sooner than be ruined, there are foreign powers who will take us by the hand and do us justice. I say this not to threaten or intimidate, but that we should reflect seriously before we act. Now, I don't get to teach politics as much as I used to now that I'm a dean. It's one of the bad things. But when I taught politics, I always wanted to make sure we got this, okay? If anyone in a political speech says, I say this not to threaten or intimidate you, they're threatening and intimidating you, right? That's an axiom. There aren't many in our business you can mark down, but that one's true, right? He is threatening and intimidating them. And I want you to think about what he's, he's threatening and intimidating them with. You, it's hard to get more factious than that. Can you imagine that an American statesman would consider his domestic political enemy so threatening and so untrustworthy that he would make common cause with recently hostile foreign powers in order to not only win a political victory, but to actually punish his domestic opponents for having the temerity to question him? Can you imagine such a thing today? Surely not. Nothing like that could happen. But I mean, this is serious stuff. I'm going to call France. I'm going to call England. I'm going to get them to come over here and kick your Virginia. Well, <laughs> Now, Gunning Bedford was known to be a blustery and cantankerous man. He had, a, he had a big round face, a pronounced comb over, a tendency to turn red when speaking with passion. This is actually drawn from descriptions of him that are contemporaneous. But any similarity to others whom we might know, this is really striking language, and Bedford wasn't alone in it. The uh, United States was very divided in 1787, and we produced a constitution nevertheless. Its occasional fo failures and foibles notwithstanding, most of us would say it was a good one. With one exception, and that one admittedly was so grave and explosive that we should not dismiss it lightly, the constitution that emerged in 1787 has served as the glue that held our country together. It has not prevented partisanship and poisonous factualism from arising, but with the one exception that we all know, I assume, right, Civil War, it has allowed partisanship to thrive and rage within a constitutional framework. And I recommend to all of your attention a fine little book on, on uh, how and why this happens. Uh, Mark Tushnet's Why the Constitution Matters, great little book, I, I think it's uh, fantastic reading. And Tushnet's argument, greatly oversimplified for this purpose, is that the Constitution has been successful because it succeeded in constraining the partisan passions that too often tear democracies apart. It runs them into channels. Now, Tushnet doesn't argue the Constitution does anything that, that would stifle partisanship. Indeed, he argues that our electoral college bicameralism, relatively complex model of separation of powers, reinforces and strengthens the two-party system and the partisanship of state and federal office holders. And yet, Tushnet, in the conclusion to that work, reflects on ways in which he thinks the Constitution prevents parties from going, as he would say, too far. He also reflects, and this was written in the mid-aughts, so I think publication date says seven, I didn't write it down, but it's about then. Um, he also reflects on some things he'd seen recently that made him wonder whether or not some of those channels were eroding and not doing as good a job as they used to do. And so, at the very end, last four pages, he comes out as a qualified supporter for an Article V convention, precisely because he thinks that such a convention might temper 
the sense in some quarters that constitutional structures are failing certain factions, failing to contain certain factions in our political system. So in what remains, I'm going to um, uh, plan to extend just real quickly a little bit of Tushnet's reasoning there, and then I'm going to wrap up with, with a reflection which is deeply theoretical and really underdeveloped, I'm the first to say. We can talk about some more in the Q&A if we want. Um, which draws on the work of James Boyd White and thinks about what a convention might do for us. But, but my purpose is not to endorse necessarily an Article V convention of the states or any particular amendments that might emerge from such a convention, but I do want to propose that we don't need to fear such a convention nearly as much as we sometimes do. You know, that's my title, Who's Afraid of the Convention of the States? And I particularly want to argue that a common argument that is used to frighten us about such a convention, namely the convention called it a period of national partisan division, poses a unique threat to our constitutional system, and treasured liberties is misguided. I don't think we need to do that. Indeed, I want to argue that the type of rationalization, that's the other title, a little rationalization now and again is a good thing, that a constitutional convention may encourage could have value for our political system. And I want to illustrate my reasons for this conclusion um, from a brief overview of the perilous moment in the 1787 convention, namely the moment that inspired Gunning Bedford to go off on his uh, tirade, tirade that we have here. Um, and this took place in the lead up to what we would call the Great Compromise, the Connecticut Compromise, the famous compromise that resulted in the formation of the Senate in 1787 and then um, the subsequent history of what happens as a result of that. All right. Um, I'm going to argue that a rationalization of the Senate, 1787-1788, may provide a model or exemplar of how constitutional rationalizations can work in practice to raise the plane of our most contentious debates and sublimate the most intractable partisan divisions into the ground on which productive constitutional structures can be founded. And I'll um, uh, wrap up quickly with some thoughts on how this can help our um, democracy. So uh, I was going to show a video clip, it's not going to go, but as, as Dr. Malloy can tell you um, here, I, I do have the script, I think, on the slide, yeah, there you go. Dr. Malloy can tell you, um, everything I know about politics um, was actually distilled from a maniacal watching and rewatching of movies from the 1970s through the 1990s. That, that's where I learned basically everything worthy of politics I know. And we could get into the argument about the degree to which Michael Corleone's character confirms or undermines Machiavelli's notion of the productive prince in the Q&A. But, but for the moment, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stick to something from The Big Chill. So how many of y'all seen The Big Chill? This is not your generation, right? Yeah, fair, okay. You basically got Michael. Michael is played by um, uh, Jeff Goldblum. He's a jerk. Uh, he's a writer for People Magazine. He's a real jerk. Um, and his friend Sam, college friend Sam, has become a uh, famous movie star in the meantime. They're brought together at the funeral of a friend from their college days and they're having a conversation about this thing. Michael talks at length, but he, he, he's talking about, you know, how his friends have judged his life choices and these sorts of things. Nobody thinks they're a bad person. I don't claim people think they do the right thing. They may knew, know they do dishonest or manipulative things, but they think there's a good reason for it. They think it'll turn out for the best. Even if it turns out best for them, is by definition what's best. So he's going on about all this, you know, basically, hey, I'm transparent. At least everybody knows I'm out to get what I want. His friend Sam says, this sounds like a massive rationalization. And this gets to the line that just kept coming back to me when I was trying to write this thing. Don't knock rationalization. Where would we be without it? I don't know anyone who can go two or three, a day without two or three rationalizations. I actually miss a word there. He calls them juicy rationalizations. They'll be more important than sex. And the Sam says, nothing's more important than sex. Michael's come back. Have you ever gone a week without a rationalization? Have you ever gone 231 years without one? Basically, I want to make an argument that, that rationalization works in a very interesting way in the context of constitutional conventions. And the rationalization that works in an interesting way in constitutional conventions, we could call them juicy rationalizations, or maybe massive rationalizations, depending on how you want to put it, is helpful, or could be at least theoretically helpful for us in a democracy and worth considering. So I'm going to start on slide number nine, um, the next one, by showing a political rationalization, okay? These are the rationalizations we see all the time. They happen constantly. You articulate a generalizable principle based on some fundamental principle principle of governance, 
but just to advance a short-term project. And they're identifiable by the willingness of political actors to abandon them immediately after they happen. Next slide, please. These are examples of recent vintage. I think we all can agree that every presidential nominee to the Supreme Court deserves an efficient vetting and a timely vote in the Senate. That was Sarah Huckabee Sanders last week. Um, we, we wonder what she might have said in 2016. This is pretty transparent rationalization. Or, surely it's only common sense that we should thoroughly understand the impact of this legislation on the deficit before we ask people to vote on it. Now this is funny because it actually isn't exactly a quote, it's a mashup from two different minority leaders of the Senate, but saying almost exactly the same sentence. Um, the two quotes I mashed together were Charles Schumer last year and Mitch McConnell in 2009, saying essentially the exact same thing, right? We know these are political rationalizations. They don't really mean that every presidential nominee to the Supreme Court deserves efficient vetting and a quick vote. Of course they didn't. They let a seat on the Supreme Court sit empty for a year, right? What they mean is my president's nominees deserve a quick vote, right? And they don't really mean that it's irresponsible to vote for something until you know its impact on the deficit is. They're saying, I don't want to vote on this right now, so we should find out what its impact on the deficit is, right? But, and now, jump over to the next side, um, what I'm calling a constitutional rationalization is a little bit different. Um, basically my argument would be, and I admit this is, this is early, but you know, due to the character of the discussion, rationalizations that are put forward for partisan purposes in constitutional conventions tend to take on more plausible layers of being principles. And I, I, I associate that with you know, the, the notion that people have in the back of their mind this, this idea that things are being said to them, they, they, they have to take it seriously. Let us never forget it's a constitution we're expanding. You can hear John Marshall's voice on that. You know, number two, due to the procedural requirements, you've got to get three quarters of the states to vote for a constitutional amendment. It forces people to more carefully hide their tracks. If they're going to do things for, for partisan and factious purposes, they have to hide that more capably. I associate that with uh, Edmund Burke and um, some writing he did on the English Constitution where he talks about covering up constitutional innovations with a delicate, well-wrought veil you know, so people wouldn't realize exactly what was at work. And finally, due to the broader language and more convincing argument, they're more likely to govern decision-making and institutional self-definition beyond their immediate value. And here I used a quote from James Madison, and I'm going to very quickly explain why I think the Senate is such a great example of this. The Senate will suspend factious legislation until reason, justice, and truth can regain their authority over the public mind. So if we jump back, I think the next slide is Gunning Bedford again, because why not, you know, you've got to have more Gunning Bedford. Um, that moment in the Constitutional Convention, when Gunning Bedford is making this threat is immediately before the Connecticut Compromise gets adopted, before they decide that they're going to put together the Senate in this peculiar way that they do um, and move past this seemingly intractable moment. If you believe Gunning Bedford on this day, it seems like if the small states have to give up their equal vote in the Senate, they're going to storm out of the convention and find foreign powers to come help them kick some but that's not what happens, right? This happens on June 29th. By July 6th, we have a new bicameral idea of how representation is going to work, and things are moving along relatively well. Now, I think part of the reason for that has to do with the Madison quote on the next slide, which I don't know if you know this, because Madison calls out what he thinks is Bedford's rationalization here. Bedford keeps saying, this is a small state, big state fight. In that same debate on June 29th, Madison says, there's not really a small state, big state fight, man. There's a free state, slave state fight. That's the fight. That's the one that really matters. The great division of interest in the United States lies between the large and the small states. It does not lie between the large and the small states. It lies between the northern and southern. So, Madison tries to unmask Bedford's rationalization here, right? And the question is, does the outcome ultimately reveal that 
the rationalization or the um, uh, unmasking that Madison does here was really what was at the root of Bedford's charge. So let's think about this for a minute. Do the small states get what Bedford says they want, right? We'll give the federal government new powers, that's fine, but just, you know, keep equal voting among the states. Do they get that in the Senate? Think on this for a moment. Do we have equal voting among the states in the Senate? Why? There's two each. So on every question that comes before the Senate, does each state get equal power in deciding how that question is going to be answered? Do they? Let's take good old Judge Kavanaugh right now, right? We don't know exactly. There are four senators. We don't know where they're going to fall. We don't know what will happen to Judge Kavanaugh, whether or not he'll be approved. But as of right now, based on what people say they're going to do, we have to recognize that 11 states have one senator committed to voting to confirm would-be Associate Justice Kavanaugh and one senator committed to voting to deny Judge Kavanaugh a seat on the U.S. Supreme Court, right? So if I'm living in Missouri or Alabama or I think of another good one that falls in there, West Virginia may, we don't know what Joe Manchin's going to do yet, but it's a possibility that I'm in one of those states. Uh, Indiana, that's a good one. Nevada. Um, if I'm in any of those states, am I getting an equal vote on the Kavanaugh nomination? No. I'm getting no vote on the Kavanaugh nomination. I got one I and one nay, and I'm canceled out. And those people from those other states, they, they got double votes either way, right? Because they're consistent. Now, why does this matter? Okay, why does this matter? Well, one possibility is that our gods and our demigods in the Constitutional Convention didn't recognize this consequence of their new design. One vote per state, two votes per state, ah, it's going to be the same thing. It's not really the same thing. I think they probably knew that. Or we could assume that they believed that on the issues that really mattered, the ones they really, really cared about, the ones that they were having this fight over in the first place, they could reliably count on senators to vote a state pre-existing factional interest. And it makes a little more sense when you think about all the other things that kind of flow through when the three fifths, when the, when the um, Connecticut Compromise goes in because as part of this they start writing how all the legislation is going to work. It not only gives you two senators per state but it puts them under the election of the state legislatures which means state legislatures are going to be policing what those senators do. You get the three-fifths bonus for slaves in the population for the popular house and the house of representatives and you get explicit limits on even constitutional amendments, remember the end of our amendment five, article 5, that say you can't end the slave trade till 1808 and you can't take away each state's equal representation in the Senate, did they think they secured what they really wanted adequately? That's really the question. Do I have a slide for Charles Coteworth's Pinckney next? I can't remember if I did one. Okay, I'll just have to do it. Um, one, one reason why I find this really persuasive is a uh, speech that Charles Coteworth's Pinckney gives in the South Carolina Ratification Convention. Um, in which he kind of coyly kind of dances around several of these issues we've just been talking about um, in, in reference to a colleague who said, if you create the strong national government, they're going to come and take away our slaves, Charles. And he finally wraps up, he says, well, in short, considering all the circumstances, and he didn't want to get into all the details, we have made the best terms for the security of this species of property it was in our power to make. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, don't dig too deeply, we got this. Vote yes on the Constitution. And the Senate did defend slavery well, we have to say. It was an arrangement that was virtually formalized by the Missouri Compromise. It persisted for 30 years. It was only when, quote unquote, equal free and slave representation in the Senate started to break down as a theory in the 1850s that we start the, the rolling train wreck that leads us into the time the Constitution didn't work, right? But whether you buy my argument that the construction of the Constitution that followed the Great Compromise was a constitutional rationalization to secure slavery or not, 
covered over with a well-wrought veil. The real rationalization that interesting, is interesting to me is James Madison. Madison didn't like the Senate. In fact, if you read the constitutional debates, Madison is one of the primary speakers on the floor. He's all through the Virginia plan. He's driving this thing. This is his show until the Great Compromise. And then Madison's around and he talks some, but he kind of starts to fade towards the background, in part by his own writings because he was really upset. He felt like proportional representation was what the Constitution should include. Big states should get more votes than small states. He was upset about the Senate. But, and here's the thing, it's none other than Madison who ultimately provides the classic defense of the Senate in Federalist Paper 62 and 63. His account of the value of the Senate is an august body populated by deeply experienced and independent-minded statesmen who would bring their own prudence and judgment to thorny questions and who would be willing to stand up to even their own party or faction and what every school child learns about the Senate. Madison tells that whole story. He's the one that explains what the Senate is for, right? I think I do have a slide on that, right, Chris? Yeah. Right, skip that one. Already passed that. There you go. Yeah, and we, I don't know, those of you who study politics surely have read this. This is what everybody reads. Yeah. The cool, deliberate sense of the community, you know, ought to always prevail in free governments. It's the Senate, this experienced, just, independent minded body of men, they are going to be the ones that provide a way of going forward. Now I'm obviously probably over suggesting the power of this constitutional rationalization, but I also think it's interesting to see how formative it is, both institutionally and personally. The Senate wasn't given Rule 22 and blue slips and filibusters and high cloture standards in Article I of the Constitution. None of those things were written down anywhere. All the stuff that makes the Senate slow and deliberate and likely sometimes to act as a check on the House. The Senate developed these institutional rules and mechanisms over time for itself. In part, I think, because it believed Madison's constitutional rationalization that he gave him. Madison didn't really want the Senate. He didn't really believe, probably, in what the Senate's ultimate purpose was. But he told a story about the Senate in a constitutional debate, and that story came to dominate. And I say it came to dominate in some ways, not just institutionally, but also personally. Man, can we think of somebody who stood out and got really celebrated and self-consciously styled themselves as a maverick, independent thinker who was willing to stand up to party and knew what the U.S. Senate was for? Anybody talked about such a person of late? I don't think they really, maybe you're wrong from what you're saying about James Madison now. I don't think that person has existed. <laughs> maybe he hasn't. But people have played that role, haven't they? Put on that coat? Well, it may not be. Yeah. But sometimes it leads people to behave in certain ways. Don't you think John McCain relished that moment when he felt like he was living up to Madisonian's, Madison's vision of what a Senate should be when he walked out on the floor and votes against his own party to, you know, save Obamacare from a disastrously underbaked you know, replacement. I think he did. I think he talked about himself that way to the press. I think he went up to reporters and said, you know, essentially, here's the story I want you to tell about me, right? Now, it may be a false front, and it may be a rationalization. It can also be valuable. The two aren't mutually exclusive. But having said all that about how these rationalizations take on a life of their own in a constitutional setting, does it support the idea that we might have little to fear and much to gain from an Article V convention in the near future? So my answer really quickly just would be this, okay? We need to look at how our institutions work and think about whether or not they would be improved by having to provide a justification for themselves in the current context. And I think the Senate and the Kavanaugh nomination is a very good version of this to reflect on. Some people might say, and I might be willing to join them, that we're in need of a reconstitution of our common political narratives and shared constitutional rationalizations. James Lloyd White wrote this great work, um, 1980s, it was when I was in college, I'm that old. Um, and White argued that 
Constitutions are rhetorical constructs of a peculiar sort. They're lexicons that dictate what constitutes legitimate forms of argument and what doesn't constitute legitimate forms of argument. And they serve to dictate what can and cannot be said and thus constrain action first and foremost by constraining speech. This is one of the better quotes on the subject. This constitution, like other such instruments, is in a literal sense a rhetorical constitution. It constitutes a rhetorical community working by rhetorical processes that it is established but can no longer control. It establishes a new conversation on a permanent basis. When you change the Constitution, you establish a new conversation on a permanent basis. You lay out a set of, of terms we're going to argue about. Now, in the United States, over those long period of time, we've allowed that constitutional discussion to mostly be a constitutional argument of specialists, of lawyers and justices and judges who argue constitutional issues before the Supreme Court of the United States or the federal courts of the United States in general. And that's where most of that discussion and constitution reframing and rediscussion and recreation takes place. James Boyd White says we miss lots of interesting opportunities for other places it could have taken place. We could have much more constitutionalized elections than we do. We could have much more constitutionalized discussions about advice and consent in the Senate than we do. We could have much more constitutionalized discussions about um, tax policy than we do. But we don't tend to do that. We tend to leave the constitutional discussion for the specialists. But ask yourself this question if you've been following what's been going on with Kavanaugh now in the Senate. Have we reached a point where the discussion around constitutional issues is beginning to merge down into the type of rationalization we see in narrow, more narrow politics. Kavanaugh's finger-waving denunciation of the Democratic side of the committee that's approving him as on a winch hunt to undermine his life and his, his, his appointment, right? Could he seriously walk out of the room afterwards and expect that we believed him when he said he wasn't a partisan? Or was that a pretty transparent political rationalization? John Roberts, you may, well, you don't remember because you're only like too young for this, but to me it's yesterday. John Roberts, you know, was famous for the, he, he, he always wanted to go, his go-to thing was the umpire rationalization um, when, he was, when he was in front of the Senate. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm signing up to be an umpire. I'm not going to, you know, uh, I'm just calling them like I see them. I'm not going to pitch or bat in this game. You know, I'm not a member of either of the teams. Um, that seems to be breaking down in some way. What I think White's suggestion of constitutional conventions serving as narrative frameworks is perhaps an invitation to an Amendment 5 convention in which we the people get the opportunity once again to participate in laying out frameworks and rationalizations about how we think the discussion about our Constitution should work. And it's an interesting possibility. If we have reached a point where we don't think that those narratives provide adequate legitimacy to the institutions we currently have, perhaps re-engaging them directly through the people would be a good thing. Now there's no guarantee I would advocate for any particular Article V convention that's out there now. There's so many questions we don't know the answer to. I'm be the first to say. How would delegates be named or elected? Would a new convention vote with one vote per state as in 1787 or some proportional system of representation? Would the convention have certain proposals to debate and a limited purview or would it be a more open-ended mandate? Can it talk about anything? Can it reconsider even the Senate itself? You know, would the convention's proposals be time limited in the ratification window like most World War II amendments coming from Congress have been, or could a convention leave so-called zombie amendments, this is actually what they call it in the business, zombie amendments out there um, that could be ratified at any point in the future. Keep in mind we just saw the 27th Amendment get ratified 200 years after it passed both houses of Congress, you know. Would conventions leave things lying around that could be picked up at some future date and used in radically different ways than all of these questions and more would need to be resolved. However, I would say that Article 5 does offer us a way consistent with the Constitution we have to engage in a broader conversation from which a, set of, a new set of constitutional rationalizations might arise. I take some hope from the example of uh, Iceland's remarkable constitutional process in 2012-13. Any of you all follow the Icelandic Constitutional Convention? Really? Yeah, good. That's good stuff. They, they actually did it with real citizens. 
selected by lottery. Here, you're going to get paid. You're going for four months. There's going to be a constitutional convention. At the end of Friday every week, they put up their most recent version on Facebook and let people comment on it. Now, that might be a little bit radical for American taste, right? From our locked up room in Philadelphia, saw it on the walls, black windows, too, you know. Here it is, guys. Fill in the comments field below. Maybe we could have somebody, you know, read it out loud on, on YouTube. And then my daughter would watch it. Always. She's always, she, she says she doesn't like writing, but when it comes to filling in that comments field, man, she's just like, Burr. Anyway. Um, I do think that it's worth reflecting on whether or not that might be an interesting place to start. So, thank you, and sorry to run long. And All right, folks, we've got time for Q&A, question and answer. The answer will be your part. Oh, I have to answer? The question. <laughs> Questions are your part, so I'll, I'll kind of moderate the Q&A. Who would like to ask the first question? Yes, sir. So are there no, there is no way of bringing about a constitutional convention that was never established on how that would be brought about? No, no, I mean there is. The, the states, two-thirds of the states can request one, and, and at that point a convention should be called. Now you will notice, and this is a thing that I've looked for answers on and I can't find a law review on it. It's a great question. Uh, Amendment 5 goes passive voice on us. What do we know about passive voice? Passive voice is always dangerous, right? You know, on application of two-thirds of the states to Congress, a convention shall be called. Who calls it? Right? Who tells it what it to do? Who tells it how it's going to vote? Who tells it where its delegates come from? Right? We, we don't know. Now, maybe this is partially just sloppy legislative drafting. After all, when did they decide they were going to put this in? September 15th. They were closing shop in 48 hours. Or, um, you know, perhaps Kramer's very clever, thought that they would force you to have that discussion as part of the ramp up to have a convention. I don't know. But, but, but we do know that they can do it. The question is, would they do it? And if so, what would they do with it? Yes, sir. Next question. I have a question. Uh, I um, now this might sound a little silly because he's, but I have a question for both uh, for both of you all, if you don't mind. Um, oh, yeah, that's great, and then I'll just punt the question for me over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I didn't get what were you saying. Um, your position was at the start of it. Um, I didn't quite get that part. Oh, uh, the endowed chair. I'll, I'll huddle with you after the event and, and straighten it okay. up. And then. Um, so uh, for you, uh, what university are you associated with? I'm at uh, Bethany College. Okay. In West Virginia, yeah. in the Provost of Other questions? Yes, sir. Dr. Bean. Uh, so one thing I'm wondering is a lot of, it seems like a lot of the argument that we shouldn't necessarily fear a constitutional convention rests on the idea We've kind of seen this already, and it wasn't as bad as we thought, right? We had this factional time like we do today. It overran its purview like it mm -hmm. could today. Right. But it seems like the assumption there is that then it resulted in something okay. But it resulted in a constitution in some ways, we could argue, we've spent 200 years trying to fix through amendments that, mm -hmm. as you mentioned with the Madison quotes at the end, right. allowed 20 years of uh, bringing in African captives, 200,000 people that wouldn't have been, 80 years of slavery, sure. massive curbs on democracy, voting of <laughs> senators, uh, preventing women from voting, all of these things. Right. And we've got all these amendments that have made it not as bad. Right. So it seems like if we got something like the Constitution again, mm -hmm. couldn't we argue that would be kind of a disaster? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I find it very unlikely we would reproduce the Constitution we started with in 1787 and have to go through 200 years of fixing those mistakes. We would make new ones. Right. You could come up with all these new issues. Yes. Things with unintended consequences, right? Lots of those you mentioned. Oh, sure. Like vague writing, holes in the Constitution. Absolutely. Like Absolutely. But my argument would, then would be, wait, if we know that to be true, right? That, that the Constitution we have received is imperfect, okay? 
how much should we fear the idea that we might try to perfect it further? Um, I think the reason that the 1787 convention um, in some ways stands so singularly in our constitutional imagination um, is, is the result of largely probably historical accident as much as anything else. Uh, it's, it's not the case, I think, that they walked away from the convention in 1787 thinking, we'll never do this again for the next 200 plus years. They probably walked away expecting that conventions, at least on some sort of narrow basis, were gonna happen within 20 or 30 years, maybe within their lifetimes. Um, and in fact, calls went out, never garnering the sufficient two-thirds, but calls did go out um, within 10 years you know, for, for conventions on a variety of possible subjects. Now, was it an imperfect constitution? Sure, it was, and it had lots of issues with them. And if, in fact, my reading of what, you know, ultimately assuaged Gunning Bedford and others is correct, in some ways that's a startling failure. I mean, a terrible failure. Well, the question you'd have to ask yourself is, could they have done better under the circumstances? They created something that was neutral on its face, that wasn't explicitly perhaps about slavery, and that could roll on into the future when slavery was no longer around, I guess. Okay, there's hands over here. Yes, Dr. Cross? Um, well, I, I, I like your idea quite a bit, actually, and as I was thinking, I was hoping you'd respond to this, and this kind of builds on uh, Dr. Beamish's comment, which is, uh, it seems like the fears of a runaway convention might be overemphasized at this point, given that we already have a runaway constitution, uh, in a sense, you know, because if you think the creation of the party system, you know, and, and its effect on politics, the Electoral College changes through the 12th Amendment and so on, the intense partisanship that is now motivated by party rather than by region or slave anti-slave, the suffrage expansion that uh, Dr. Beamish mentioned, the 14th Amendment, which changed the relationship between the national government and the state, selective incorporation. I mean, you can go on and on and say, yeah. you know, our Constitution has completely haphazardly evolved in a different direction. Put the Citizens United at the bottom of that list, and you can say, what could go wrong? <laughs> Who's afraid of a convention of the states, right? I mean, that's a... That, 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 I think, is a really compelling argument that, that, that shouldn't be defeated. Could it be defeated substantively by, by a discussion of possible amendments and a decision maybe we can't do better? Perhaps. Um, but it shouldn't be defeated by a mythology would, would be part of my argument, right? The, myth, the mythology um, will mislead us to think, oh, you know, partisanship and interested behavior and the types of things like this, these aren't going to happen. These would happen at a convention today, but they didn't happen then. Of course they did. You know? And they, to some degree, some of them, got sublimated into principles that were more worthy, perhaps, even than the interest the principle served. Um, so, yeah, I'm with you. It's at least worth looking seriously at. And no. after all, we, I, I haven't said this, I don't think yet, I'll just throw in real quickly. Keep in mind, I did have a paragraph about it, but I was kind of cutting a little bit at the end. At the end of the day, when this convention meets, if, if an Article 5 convention met, right, and it produced something, little somethings, two or three little uh, amendments, or a big something, like, you know, a pretty fundamental rewrite, it's got to be approved by three quarters of the state legislatures or conventions called in the states to take effect. And there's been no time in modern American history where one political party has control of both houses of the state legislature and three quarters of the states. So the idea that somehow a runaway convention is going to throw out a partisan constitution that, that disenfranchises some significant part of the United States for the next generations probably is very unlikely. I want to throw a question at you uh, sure. myself, Dr. Lane. You mentioned Iceland. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you've followed something more recently that I do know some of my students have been following, which is what Ireland did. Mm -hmm. Okay, so only one letter difference, the C to the R. Right, you switch one. But, but Ireland um, held a uh, constitutional consultation with randomly selected citizens, kind of like a jury, mm -hmm. uh, about 100 of them, mixed in with some members of parliament, uh, and they proposed a body of, of changes to the Irish Constitution. 
including on the, the tricky, touchy issue of abortion, mm -hmm. uh, and then put that to a public vote. So, so if, if Facebook, you think, might be too radical, <laughs> what about the notion that, that delegates from states uh, might include non-professional politicians? Is that, is that conceivable? I, I think it's conceivable. I think it's interesting. The question is whether or not people would rise to the occasion. Um, White, who, who I cited at the end, who's a really big influence on me, um, has this love-hate relationship with what happened to American constitutionalism in practice. I mean, he is a law professor, right? So he's in that legal framework. And, he, and he, he says, you know, the discourse on constitutionalism we have in American law is really an unprecedented thing in the history of the world. People get really highly educated. They really work on this. It's in some ways a devotion. He, he likens it in places to uh, the devotion of a monk, uh, you know, uh, to God. You know, they really are a priestly tribe in a lot of ways, not just in the fact they wear robes, right? But on the other hand, he really, really is uncomfortable with it because he says we developed this this framework into which we have constitutional discussions, and we walled it off. And we said, this is the province of this profession and people like this, right? And, and, and what was lost in that is the ability of common people to talk, you know, in some ways to feel like they were competent and invited to talk professionally, you know, competently about their constitution. He sees that as an issue. I think he's right. We've got time for a couple more questions. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, so what were the three documents? I know there was the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. What would have been the third one from that time period, or were those two it? Well, no, I was, I was oh. not referring to that. So when I said that there were um, at least three opportunities to try to flesh out a national um, constitution, I referred to that the Continental Congress frames and then, and then debates and then revises and submits once for ratification and a second time. Actually, it kind of was a rolling thing for a while there, the Articles of Confederation. And then the previous year in 1786, um, a call goes out to all the states, let's all meet in Annapolis and talk about what we're going to do about the Articles of Confederation. Only five states send delegates, um, but those delegates include some pretty heavy hitters and what's going to follow and they get together and they put together a petition that ultimately goes to the Congress and results in the Constitutional Convention we have. Some people would lump in a fourth. Some people say the Mount Vernon meeting of 1785 when George Washington basically brings back his general staff from each of the, at least one from each of the colonies and says, is this thing working? Is this what we thought we were buying? Um, some people saw that as, as maybe an early attempt at trying to engineer something like a Constitutional Convention. Um, so this is going on, but you've got to keep in mind, too, um, you know, among 13 states, right, we have 13 states when we go to the Constitutional Convention, they've been free from Great Britain by the most charitable version of things for 11 years. If you start on July 4, 1776, um, you know, a lot of parts of the country weren't, weren't out of Great Britain until much later in the Revolutionary War than that. You know, those 13 states managed to have 24 different state constitutional conventions during that period of time from 1776 to 1787, even in the midst of the fact that for seven of those years you're fighting a war. So, you know, they constitutional conventions. They did it a lot. And the honor of asking the final question goes to... <laughs> I'd like Ray. To, I, 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 Ray first. Yes, go right ahead. Um, um, from your argument, it seems that you have pointed out that the, the need for a constitutional convention could be very beneficial to our institutions. Mm -hmm. My question is, well, it's, it's kind of long. It's more of a comment and then a question. So um, there are obvious reasons for a constitutional convention. People uh, act in the best interest of themselves. So um, this is shown from your um, lecture through Madison, mm -hmm. who was arguing strongly about the slave trade, and then mm -hmm. once he got what he wanted, he kind of started quieting it down. Mm -hmm. So then, back then it was the North against the South. Now it's the Democratic Party against the Republican Party. So my question to you is, could starting a new conversation, which would be the Constitution, um, mm -hmm. could that eventually not happen because of the partisanism? I think, I think partisanship makes it hard to imagine. Now, if we're talking about, is it a good thing? Okay, that's one question. 
Is it a plausible thing that will occur? There I have questions about whether or not partisanship as currently exercised would um, allow it to move forward. I, I think as strong as partisanship is felt, I think any sort of, hey, we've got 30, 34 states, we're ready to go, there's gonna be a constitutional convention, here are the topics. I think it's gonna be very hard to get through the procedural questions that I raised at the end. How are the delegates chosen? How are they apportioned? How will they vote when they get there? All those sorts of things are gonna be played to partisan advantage to the nth degree. And I think that's gonna be, in some ways, your most impressive hurdle. Even if we assume, as I've sort of suggested, and I'd admit, this is not something I've proven. Don't think I've proved it. I'm just suggesting a possibility. That there's a sense of responsibility that can take over when people find themselves placed in that, I've got to speak here about a constitution that my countrymen may live by for, you know, 80, 100 years in the future. Even if you assume that to be true, right? You first got to get them into that room. You first got to get them into that, that discussion where that sense of themselves takes hold. And that's gonna, there are gonna be a lot of procedural hurdles there, and I think the parties will try to play those procedural hurdles to the hilt. So, um, you know, that makes me a little skeptical of what will happen. Also because times change, as you know, um, the House of Senate and the House of Republicans is mainly, is predominated by the Republicans. So, what I was basically um, trying to get at is the fact that since it changed, mm -hmm. would the conversation also constantly be changing, therefore yes. creating a, a deferment on the Constitution of the Ray, how did it really change? Oh, here you go. It's fantastic. But don't think that it's changed because it wasn't just Republicans and Democrats. Remember, in the beginning, it was Federalist versus Republicans. And that massive partisanship was so hateful that people said George Washington was, quote unquote, a sort of fascist. So if you think that we could have a partisan situation and a new constitution now, because we couldn't have it back then, mm -hmm. we were bloody lucky we got what we had. Because the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists dissolved. But the Federalists versus Thomas Jefferson's Republicans just made that issue so hateful you can't imagine it. It makes partisanship day look like a little children's garden. <laughs> so, so, when you're talking about, and your question is very good, but when you start talking about the fact that partisanship, partisanship today may make a constitutional convention impossible, let's go back to the original situation where Jefferson would just pillory the greatest human being of, I think, our generation in terms of democracy, George Washington. It was a horrific situation. Thomas Jefferson was the worst Secretary of State of the United States. I can't stand the man worth anything. Mike Pompeo is so relieved to hear you say that. Yeah. <laughs> He's but off the hawk. You <laughs> have to go back, I think, Joe, to really understand and bring, bring a good, how partisan we were in the beginning. I am amazed that we even have a Constitution today. Aren't we all? <laughs> <laughs> on that which note, makes me thank the you, audience. Which makes me wonder this, sorry. <laughs> which makes me wonder if you want a constitutional convention and it barely got off, what would happen if we wanted one today? We can barely do things in Louisiana. <laughs> if you want a constitutional convention, I just wonder whether that poison you might ask, Ray, is, is, is worth what you might get. Now I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, y'all. No, thanks, Brian. That's great. Dr. Lane. Uh, I, I appreciate all you all coming. It's a fun conversation to have and one well worth thinking about. I, I, think, I think the, um, the, the takeaway is that, that you know, we have to be cognizant of the fact that um, these issues of constitutional governance are, are, are in front of us today. And, and precisely because of the toxic political atmosphere we, we live in. And, and we should not cede the ground in the discussion to a series of specialists to take place you know, when cases are properly presented to the federal courts. This needs to be something that we're, 
we're willing to have as a conversation, you know, uh, in rooms like this one all over the country and not just on college campuses, um, uh, to ask the question about whether or not our Constitution is serving us as well as it might and what we might do to make it serve us better.